All right, we're back with Andy Goldmark, who produced this record with John Novello. We're just going to get a little bit of uh, your take on it. Sure. So you are a <coughs> keyboard piano player? Keyboard, piano, uh, songwriter, uh, producer, um, arranger, and was an artist at one point. Right? Many hats. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What, what was your artist uh, phase? I started out as a singer-songwriter, early 1970s, okay. um, and uh, I ha evolved out of that. Um, had a had an album out that, that uh, did well critically, but but not so well sales wise. Wise, and then uh, later on in the 70s, had a Blue White Soul group on A and M Records. Okay. And uh, you know, long story short, found that I was better behind the camera than in front of the camera. And uh, that's sort of what led to my career as a, as a more as a songwriter, pr producer, and label, label guy. And so with this record, um, for you, mm -hmm. it's labor of love. Yeah. This happened very organically. Yes. Um, what's your take on this record's place in the world in the in these days? Well, it's really funny, because you never know, when you're doing something, you're really doing it out of love, and you really enjoy the music, and the person you're working with is a great collaboration going on. You don't really think, well, how is this going to wind up taking its place in the world? And I've been more successful doing it that way than in a more calculated way of let's make something that belongs there and we're right. bound to cash in. Right. This was just from the gut and it was pure musical, you know, in inspiration and passion. So I, I was thinking let's let's make this more, you know, relegated to the smooth jazz world. Let's let's work within that broad confine and see if we can bring a little bit more energy and, and, and creativity to something that, that, that we both like doing and see how that flies without kind of boxing ourselves in. And, but at the same time, making sure we weren't going too far afield in any direction, I realized I've just completely contradicted myself. <laughs> That's okay, we're all right with that. But it is all of that stuff combined. <laughs> yeah. it, it, it was like not watching the road, but making sure we weren't going into a ditch. Well, That's it sounds like you kind of didn't know the destination until you got there. We didn't, but we, we it was a gut check along the way. Yeah. You know, it, in other words, it's like, I guess the best way of putting it is, you know, doing it, loving it, getting into it, and then saying, okay, now, what do we just do? How does it sound? It's just, you know, do we need to make adjustments here? Do right. we need to make this more relevant to what we're trying to do? And right. That's kind of what happened. Well, um, and obviously did one or two two of your songs on this record, or more? Did, uh, I'd say four at the end, or four or five. Four or John five. and I wrote a, a couple of things, Ivory cool. Soul, Shuffle the Deck, where we brought in uh, Tom Scott to do the sax work on that. Nice. Um, and then there was an older song I wrote with a country uh, writer, a great country writer named Keith Steele. Um, and then, uh, you know, along with everything else, yeah, we kind of, it, it, it just kept kind of evolving, one song after another, let's try this one, let's do that. But, you know, I have to, do, I have to say that every time we did that, it really had to be something that John was feeling. And, sure. and he was very clear and decisive about that. If he was feeling it, then we moved ahead, and if he wasn't, you know, we said, all right, let's put that. Was there anything you had to really work hard to convince him at? I would say the only thing I really had to work hard at convincing him to do was to make the switch from the B3 to the acoustic piano on Crush. Right. He was just, you know, I mean, he when he gave that first performance where he was just going to try it out, you know, right. there were a couple little places where I went, okay, that's it. We've yep. got to bottle that and spread that out across the record. Nice. And if he can do that, and of course he did, then I know we really have something. Cool. That was the toughest, really, one to get him, you know, sold on. And not, you know because he, he didn't want or was being stubborn about it, it's just that he had invested himself so completely in the B3 version of it. Right. You can understand, it's not that easy to say, okay, now that you <laughs> left everything out there in the playing field, can you go back and play four more quarters? Right. It's just not that easy. No, not at all. <coughs> um, so, um, when you, as you're a player as well. A little bit, yeah. A little bit. Uh, your directions to John in terms of the melodies, in terms of whatever he's talking about, you right. as a carver. Right. Um, right. Yeah. How, how much carving did you need to do, or did it all kind of work itself? Uh, it sounds such a, such an organic process. Well, it is, it's very organic, and it happened in many different kinds of ways, but it was like, you know, uh, if I felt in certain areas and phrases like, you maybe you're playing a little too much, just simplify the melody, and, and you know. And if he was ever asking, John's not shy, he said, well, tell me, what are you hearing? I'll tell him what I'm hearing. Yeah. But I'd always prefer that he got there in his own way, in his own sound because that's when it remains more authentic and as producer I got to make sure that he's coming out at the end of the day with something that really represents him and he feels good about Absolutely. so I had to tread a fine line and it's always a fine line by the way whether it's with him or with a singer that you're bringing out the best of them and in this case with John it's really easy because he's game to 
you know, really give it his all and try anything. But it would be saying, well, maybe a little less here, maybe a little more there, maybe even let's take this melody and let's put it over here in the song and that one put it down there and gotcha. all kinds of stuff. I mean, now obviously with technology, you can do any and all of it. Right. right. Did you have any uh, records or artists that as you were doing this were touchstones for the piano sound or the playing style or whatever that um, you kind of felt? Well, this, this is what's so interesting about it is that the focus a a along the way was really to keep all the other names and voices and players way in the background and say, where are you, John Novello? Yeah. Make yourself a step forward. Let this be. Who are you inside? And that was, for me, always about where's your soul in this? Because it can't really come true any other way. Right. So, I mean, we we would talk about other players we were hearing. I mean, I guess sure. Ramsey Lewis's name came up once or twice. And maybe, you know, um, uh, Greg Filling Gaines or just people we touched upon. But it really was always about what are you hearing here? Because the good thing about John is that he has an authentic touch on the on the piano but he's also got his own soul in it sure. and that's the easiest thing to work with in the world that's amazing awesome well anything else to uh, add specifically <coughs> about uh, I know you do you track real piano not digital or digital piano um, a little bit of both you know we had varying combinations of things without giving away the recipe it, yeah. uh, it was <laughs> it was a lot of different things but uh, it was always about making sure whatever piano we had going on whether it was live or in the digital make sure it sounded real and like you know you could right. walk away saying okay I played acoustic piano absolutely um, cool uh, yeah. well I'll, and I'll, I would ask you too what your favorite artists that you know coming up as in the keyboard realm, um, in the keyboard realm, who who really turned you on when you were starting out to? Well, when I was starting out way back then, you mean? Okay. Yeah. Well, so you you hit it on the nail with your Richard T was huge for me, and I I used him on sessions in New York. Did you? So I had Richard T, Leon Pendarvis, who by oh. the way was just awesome. That's a name you don't hear about. Though. Yeah, and oh, well. Anthony Jackson on bass. We had Chris Parker or Steve Gadd on drums. Amazing. And you know when Richard would sit down, he'd come in. He was a big fella, and and he was. All church when you sit down, and it's what he played between takes that I would run out to listen to, and I just oh. sit there and I would listen. To, he would just go church. It was the octave. It was like, <laughs> <laughs> and and as a side note, it's really interesting because we talk about the evolution of the smooth jazz world and where that came from. I was talking to this this lady last week, and she's in the radio aspect of it, but she's very smart. Um, she, her name is Samantha Pasquale, and, and she was talking about, you know what? She said the evolution of smooth jazz had a huge resurgence when all the sidemen started to make smooth jazz records, uh -huh. like Paul Jackson um, and Nathan East, both of whom I've known forever and are great people and really, really great musicians. And when she said that, it triggered something in a memory that I always noticed, and that is whenever I was doing a session with these musicians, with their caliber, right. it's what happened when the take was done that oftentimes was more interesting than anything else, because they'd always go to the group. Right. You know, technically, okay, we got a great one, guys, and all of a sudden you're shuffling around, and then Gad or someone's there, you know, and then Anthony would go, and, that's and then Richard have tape David, down, 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 like, my God, let's just do this. Right. <laughs> and that, to me, is almost like what's happened, the best of smooth jazz. I mean, is that that energy and, and, and flow and groove has just all of a sudden become its own kind of genre. And I miss those days when you could follow a musician around record to record. Yeah. And, you know, you could really, like, I'm still, I'm still discovering records that Richard T. played on and yes. that Eric Gale played on and stuff. But yeah. nowadays it seems that... It's not so much the case. Yeah, it isn't. It, I mean, it, because it's all being done in box right. with people who are actually doing amazing stuff. You know, it's just they're they're creating in a whole different way than, than it used to be. It's just it's it's difficult. Like look, I, I play clavinet. I just yeah. played clav on a record for a guy. I loved it. It was great, but yeah. it's not too many people calling to get clavinet on no. the real clav on the records. <laughs> but I, I think I really do have faith. I don't think this is blind faith. I think that will come back around. I mean, I have high hopes that someone like Max Martin, who began as a live guitar player right. and a rock band himself, at some point is going to say, okay, let's get a band in here. I'm going for it. Right. I'm going to just take take everything else I've been doing and, and go that route. And I think a lot of other people will, too. I think, I think people like Kanye West and Jay-Z, they love 
that kind of musicianship. Well, they you know have and a live band play with them. Yeah, I think a lot of the ability to quantize, the ability to auto tune and melodyne, yeah. people use it because it's there yeah. rather than saying let's nail the take. Yes, you know yeah. instead of well we'll fix it. No, let's nail it. Yeah, you know uh, yeah. I think we've lost a little bit of that. So the people who can nail it, right, end up being kind of a rarity and standing out. And yeah. maybe that will come back, and there'll be you know. Only a couple people left when the dust is clear. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, um, thank you for your time. I guess we're going to dig a little more into the record. We'll be right back.